The more carefully one studies the production process of the Book of Mormon, the more interesting the questions become. For example, since Joseph Smith never could read the original base language engraven on the plates, what did he mean when he said he translated the Book of Mormon? And was his translation best characterized as a tight translation, a loose translation, or something else entirely? And if the Book of Mormon was translated correctly the first time, why did Joseph Smith make changes and adjustments to the text for subsequent editions years later? Also, did Joseph translate with one seer stone or two connected in a bow? And just how common was seer stone use in the broader New England culture in Joseph Smith's day? And when did their use die off in both U.S. and church culture? Today on Church History Matters, we sit down with Dr. Michael McKay, one of the world's foremost scholars on seer stones and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, to discuss these and other great questions. I'm Scott Woodward, a managing director at Scripture Central, and my co-host is Casey Griffiths, also a managing director at Scripture Central. And this is our sixth and final episode in this series dealing with the marvelous, shocking, and utterly unique story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Now let's get into it. Hello, Casey. Hello, Scott. How are you? Super good, man. I'm excited about today's episode particularly. We've been talking a lot about Book of Mormon translation. You and I have been through, what, five hours so far of discussion about Book of Mormon translation, the coming forth, the witnesses. And uh, today we get to have a special guest with us. We're excited. Do you want to tell us who's with us? Yes, we have with us Dr. Michael Hubbard McKay, who is a colleague of mine here at Brigham Young University, used to be just down the hall from me. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. McKay is an associate professor of religion in the Department of Church History and Doctrine. He's a former historian and writer for the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Uh, he teaches world religions, history of Joseph Smith, Doctrine and Covenants, Foundations of the Restoration. He's also the author of several books focusing on antebellum American religion, Joseph Smith, and the production of Latter-day Saints scripture. He's currently working within ritual studies in the midst of publishing an edited volume re-examining the work of Victor Turner and co-authoring a book on the development of Latter-day Saint ritual and scripture. Mm. I want to also take a minute and point out some of the best books uh, Mike has been involved with that our listeners should get their hands on a copy of. Each of these are essential reading when it comes to Book of Mormon translation. Joseph Smith Seer Stones, uh, Mike wrote that along with Nick Frederick. There's a new one, a short one out called Let's Talk About the Translation of the Book of Mormon by Mike and Garrett Dirkbont. Uh, that's a quick read but would give you the essentials. And then there's the volume that really kind of introduced a lot of people to these ideas. It's called From Darkness Unto Light, Joseph Smith's Translation and Publication of the Book of Mormon. That is also co-authored with Garrett Dirkbont, who's another great scholar on Book of Mormon translation. Yeah. Mike, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you. Thanks. You're a great friend, great scholar. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Excited about this new podcast. Well, that means a lot coming from you. If, if Mike McKay endorses it, then I feel good. Well, I guess you didn't go so far as to say endorse. <laughs> uh, you just said excited, so I'll, I'll be modest. <laughs> That's an endorsement. Oh, good. That's not a condemnation, so I guess we'll take it. <laughs> we'll take whatever we can get. <laughs> We're just glad you're here. Yeah. Could you begin maybe by telling us a little bit about how you got interested in studying so deeply about, you know, seer stones and all things related to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith, that whole world. Like, how'd they get started for you, Mike? Yeah, it's, um, I think the first time I was like deeply invested in this was probably when I started at the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Hmm. This was an idea that was being kicked around. We were reading everything that was written about it, trying to uncover the historical record that described the translation process. Mm. Um, before that, though, I remember I had a mission companion. I went to Honolulu, Hawaii mission. I remember I had a, I had a mission companion who asked me what I thought about Joseph Smith's seer stones, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so that was probably the first time I heard about it. Fast forward to the guy who actually writes the book about it. That's a fun beginning. Yeah. But at the Joseph Smith Papers Project, doing documents volume one required analysis and research on the topic. 
and even in you know 2009 there's still there's tons and tons of research that's been done by that time there's so many people that have written on it hmm. mark asher smith he was my next door neighbor he probably still is the og probably the person that knows more about the translation than anyone hmm. and so he was he was helping me that's when I got really interested. Mark has a way of developing historical interest in everybody's mind. He's like one of the greatest gifts to Mormon history that we have. He's, he's amazing. Wow. So I think under Mark's tutelage, I started thinking. The other thing, like me and Garrett Dirkmott, who was working on it with me, you know, the academic understanding of it was sort of foreign to both of us. Uh -huh. And Don Bradley came on board too, for, I think it was for like a year or something. And Don Bradley, had, he was like Mark Asherson McGee, and he was fully invested years before that, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the Joseph Smith Papers is when it happened. Mm -hmm. And then we got involved in the essays and things like that, and it all took off from there. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we're excited to ask you some questions today. Yeah. I want to start with a question about seer stones. Uh, just how common were seer stones used by other people in Joseph Smith's New England culture? And there's like this girl down the street, Sally Chase, that seems to have one. And we hear about others that, that have them. Uh, that's kind of the first part of the question. And then second part is, when did the use of seer stones kind of die off in U.S. culture? And, and what about in church culture? When was that no longer a thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, I, I think the answer automatically you want to say, well, Joseph Smith's time, this was a predominant culture that he just participated in. Like, we have the tendency to want to make it, like, normalize it really quickly. Yeah. Um, I think in general, so there's been several articles that have been written about this in the broader American antebellum scene. And it, it demonstrates that this is an esoteric culture. Meaning what? Meaning that it isn't widespread. Mm. So, for example, like, would you have a leader that's been elected or a civic leader, someone who is publicly recognized, would they be using a seer stone? And, and the answer is very much likely no. Right. They wouldn't be able to have like a public presence if they were using it. So it's a kind of Christian folklore. Mm -hmm. So an average Christian might buy into the use of a seer stone for something. Mm -hmm. So things like, especially in an agrarian culture, water witching, which has made its way all the way to modern agricultural culture. Yeah, people still do that today, right? Yeah. So when it comes to like an utter rejection of it, that, that certainly is the case in certain areas of society. Mm. For Joseph Smith, though, when you think about a local culture, which like his ability to tap into a national culture and mimic the norms that, are, that a civic leader might have is less likely. So his local environment, his local culture, actually does have, it's pretty common that we have lots of examples of individuals using seer stones, but it still isn't rampantly being done. It isn't the common practice. Yeah. And so that's probably worth thinking about, like, is he doing this just because it is actually the way that one would imagine scripture being produced? <laughs> well, the answer to that is it, no. Like, in a Protestant culture, for scripture to be produced would be heretical, right? So that's the position that we're in. Yeah. Now, that being said, the culture continues because it emerges in Joseph Smith's lifetime, but it still isn't even common in the church. You don't have lots of church members using seer stones. You have the occasional use of seer stones, and then eventually Brigham Young, of course, speaks out against it, and you get a serious decline from the small number of people who are actually... Uh -huh. Like, for example, uh, the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers Museum, they actually have two seer stones from bishops. For real? Yeah. You know, in the, in the 19th century, bishops aren't very common. There are very few people. So you have an example of high leadership in the church using seer stones, but it still is not common in the church or out of the church. Whoa. So do we know more about those bishops using seer stones? Are they doing that to like discern who should serve in callings or like what are they, what are they using seer stones for? Yeah. Yeah. They're using it for revelation. Oh, man. Like Heber C. Kimball is the one we have like some of the most examples of after Joseph Smith. You know, he's water witching, he's divining revelation, things like that. Yeah. And so, especially with like the onset, the, the rise of secularism versus religion, where you have like a category in society that becomes 
distinctly different than religion. It's not like it doesn't produce morals and ethics, but the secularism that emerges in the 19th century categorizes and makes things normal or not normal. And so religious practices in a secular environment are seen as less normal. And so the normalization and the development of secularism in the 19th century eventually pushes off some of these religious practices. Interesting. But religious practices is what we want. I'm not looking for a secular world. Mm. If I'm a religious person, which I am, I am looking for that which can't be explained. Mm. And so I'm, I'm very moved by this. I'm moved by the fact that Joseph Smith is turning to the miraculous instead of like actually translating Egyptian, well, that, that's not very likely. If someone told me Joseph actually translated, I would say, I doubt it. But the fact of the matter is you get this remarkable book that is consistently demanding that there isn't an explanation. Yeah, it, clearly he used seer stones, and then the product of that was the Book of Mormon somehow, right? And, and you're saying we should bring back seer stones, is that correct? Or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, uh, I think that would be cool. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to happen. But if there was another remarkable and miraculous way that God was delivering a message to us, I would find that appealing, yes. Yeah. And if it came through seer stones or it came through like like a handkerchief that healed the sick or like a basket of bread that was bottomless that fed the poor, if you think I'm going to turn away from that as a religious person, that's where you're crazy. <laughs> the fact that I would I would try to uncover, like I would scientifically or somehow like take the miracle of the bottomless bread basket and want to unravel it so that we could maybe even reproduce it and capitalize on it. I, I'd be like, hey, I'm done with whatever you're doing. Mm. Let the miracle be the miracle. Yeah, I am distinctly a religious person. So I'm looking for the miracle as not just legitimate, but as the way of life. No, it's the miraculous side of the seer stones that kind of is attractive to you. Is that fair to say? Yes. Mm. So now, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. You mentioned that uh, you're not so sure that Joseph could translate Egyptian, right? Whether we're talking about Book of Mormon, Reformed Egyptian, or the papyrus later on. Yes. And yet he, he insists on the word translate, but we use that word. He uses that word differently than others in his day, a, a secular use of or definition of the word translate. So are there any problems with us continuing to use the word translation, or is this just certain ways that we ought to think about translation as it pertains to Joseph Smith? Yeah, this seems like a good place to start. Whoever asked that question was, I think, on to something there. Yeah. Like when you start thinking about this, like, so Joseph Smith differentiates between the revelation that he gets. He doesn't just call it all revelation. He specifically chooses things that are translation, like the Book of Abraham or the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. Like even revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. So Doctrine and Covenants is revelation. And so specifically, Joseph Smith is choosing the language and has a maintenance of the kind of language that he's using there. And yet we're talking about revelation anyways. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a marker in the sand here. The, the word translation has to have some sort of meaning that differentiate and the differentiation between normal revelation and revelation that's considered translation are two different things. Mm. So the term translation is, in fact, a demand that Joseph Smith is making about the historicity of these texts. Mm. He's demanding that the historicity of the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham are being identified through the word and use of the concept of translation, even though he's not translating. Interesting. So you'd say that translation is a subcategory of the broader umbrella term of revelation, that Joseph Smith is on purpose calling it something distinct from the rest of the kind of revelations he receives in order to point to the historicity of these texts? Yeah. So you, you'd categorize it as a type of revelation that transmits ancient text to us in our language, mediated by revelation, something like that. Yeah, using the word translation demands that there is a historicity of a previous text. Mm. The term translation, it's, it's hard to disconnect it from a claim to historicity. Yeah. And it, Joseph Smith is consistently doing it 
and differentiating it from Revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's just a simple point. And I think that's why he does it. Mm, and it yeah. doesn't mean that he's actually doing the translation. Interesting. I think in one of your uh, many things you've written on this, you suggested that when Joseph Smith reaches out or sends Martin Harris to contact those scholars, it may have been a legitimate attempt at traditional translation, right? Yeah. And then he gives up on that yeah. and realizes the only way to actually carry out the work is this inspired revelatory translation. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I think this is interesting, like going back to the idea of the relationship between the secular and the religious that's emerging very distinctly in, in 19th century religion and America. In this case, like the distinction here is that Joseph Smith actually deals with the secular answer. So like, well, can this be translated? And he was convinced enough by the visit from Harris to Mitchell and others that, like, this is something that could be translated by scholars. Mm. And I think that gave Joseph Smith confidence. It certainly gave Martin Harris confidence. Yeah. Martin Harris had every reason to bail at, at any <laughs> given point, you know. Yeah. And so the idea of how convincing are secular answers, well, to Joseph Smith and Martin Harris, they're convincing. Yeah. Now, the question of whether they did a secular translation, they admittedly say, we did not. Yeah. Saying, I translated by the gift and power of God is a very clear marker that they did not translate. Hmm. Interesting. Let's move on to another question, because this is one I'm anxious for you to answer. Um, and I'll just read it the way one of our listeners submitted it. They wrote, in the last decade, there has been much to do made about how Joseph translating the Book of Mormon by not only using the Nephite interpreters that came with the plates, but also one of his seer stones. But from the historical record, Joseph and Oliver, the ones who knew best, always seem to almost exclusively refer to the Nephite interpreters as the instrument of translation, at least in their first-hand accounts. Testimonies of Joseph translating with a single stone don't seem to show up until the 1870s to 1880s from Emma Smith, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris. How big of a deal is it that these single stone sources are quite late, and how should we think about that? And why do you think Joseph and Oliver never mentioned the single stone if it was used significantly in the translation process? Isn't this an interesting question? Like, uh, this is the question of the internal battle. So now you have like a whole bunch of people who are sold on the kind of miraculous translation. So Latter-day Saints now saying, well, wait a minute, it couldn't have happened that way. It has to happen this way. This question is a question about the analysis of documents as the evidence to demonstrate whether he was using one item or the other item to receive the translation on. I think individuals like us to engage in this debate and come to some conclusion and demonstrate that the other one is wrong. I'm not really in the fight like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's remarkable that individuals are perpetuating an answer that it has to be the Nephite interpreters as if I would be offended about that. <laughs> like, it sounds like a pretty cool argument. Like, if they were the Nephite interpreters, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> And so my position on this is, I obviously think that's totally wrong. <laughs> I've written about this for 10 years now, and, you know, I disagree with those writing about that. Yeah. I think the Book of Mormon is the best evidence against this. Oh, interesting. So tell us why. For one, like the Nephite interpreters, they're obviously in the Book of Mormon. It, I, I think it starts with Mosiah the first. This is what I write in Joseph Smith's Seer Stones. And then they're passed down to Mosiah the second. You end up with Helaman, and they, they just keep passing down in this prophetic line. Now, that's pretty cool. And it's described as two stones. That's what the Nephite interpreters are. The Book of Mormon text is very clear about this. Two stones in a bow. <laughs> I don't know what that really means. So you've got two stones. Okay, that's my first evidence. So whether it's one stone or two stones, like, it seems like this is why we're splitting hairs here. Uh -huh. And then as it's described, like, they actually get those Nephite interpreters, according to Joseph Smith, right? Mm -hmm. So he ends up with the Nephite interpreters, not a Urim and Thummim, not a biblical device, but a, a Nephite translation device. Which he later calls Urim and Thummim probably to speak to a broader biblical culture, correct? Yeah, and it's pretty clear when that actually become institutionalized. So in 1835, you see all of the Doctrine and Covenants sections 
every place that said stone or interpreters is changed over to Urim and Thummim by the 1835 version of the Doctrine and Covenants. Hmm. So you can see it kind of working through, which gives you an association with Nephite interpreters, biblical interpreters, and also these seer stones that Joseph Smith possesses, you know. Okay. And so you have an item, some sort of item that Joseph Smith is receiving the translation of something on or revelation through. Uh-huh. So this is the biggest evidence here for me is differentiating between them is an interesting historical sort of activity. But it's, I don't know that it's in the end that meaningful to say it had to be this one or it had to be that one. Mm. And this is where I think individuals start splitting the evidence and they're like, well, I think it's this one or I think it's that one. And I've done some of that. And part of the reason I've done that is like the statement that that caller had where he says, oh, the, none of these happened until the 1870s. This is, this is just flat out not true at all. Mm. Martin Harris has very early sources. Mm. You know, some of his most explicit ones come even before Nauvoo. He has them after. Martin Harris has a consistency of these remarks. And then you also have traditions through, like, for example, the tradition of Oliver Cowdery. The very first one we where you get him and his the head in the hat with the seer stone is 1830. Like it's one of the earliest sources where you have the Shaker visit. And in that Shaker visit, you get a very explicit on the ground description of these like seer stones or seer stone in a hat. So to argue that all the early sources were interpreters is just not true. Gotcha. Uh, Oliver Cowdery is also doing that. Oliver Cowdery also perpetuates the idea of the single seer stone. So traditionally now, Oliver Cowdery is the one that wants to go get the seer stone or identifies the seer stone with the Whitmers. And so you have this long tradition where the Brighamites then connect themselves and want to get the seer stone also. Mm. And so to say that Oliver Cowdery or Joseph Smith are outside of this is crazy. There's no explicit propositional statement that they want out of this. That's pretty close to true. Mm. Yet... You have this long tradition, which I would refuse to ignore. And I'm still confused why they want it not to be a seer stone, but they want it to be two seer stones that were delivered by Moroni. Like the very notion behind it is problematic for me. I really don't get why they want it to be that way. Was there any sort of stigma early on, you think, that Joseph and Oliver were trying to avoid? Because I mean, like most of their statements do mention the Urim and Thummim or the Nephite interpreters. Mm. Was there some sort of an effort to distance themselves from like common scrying or glass looking or anything like that? That one seer stone might have a stigma, whereas the two that came with the plates may not? I mean, is there any reality to that? That's possible because of Mormonism unveiled. Mormonism unveiled perpetuates one single seer stone. And what is Mormonism Unveiled for some of our listeners who might not know what Mormonism Unveiled is? Mormonism Unveiled is probably the best anti-Mormon book ever written. (laughs) (laughs) Like almost every anti-Mormon trope comes from that book. It's the OG. It is the OG of uh, (laughs) disrespecting Latter-day Saint belief and custom. So. (laughs) Can I ask a a follow-up question? You mentioned Oliver goes to the Whitmers to get the seer stone. Is that after he comes back into the church, or what's the time frame there? So the tradition goes that, so David Whitmer tells this story too. So Oliver Cowdery was supposed to have gotten the seer stone. Mm -hmm. David Whitmer, he describes that he gives Oliver Cowdery one of his seer stones. And it's that tradition where Oliver Cowdery actually is given one of them. So when Oliver Cowdery dies, he is in possession of a seer stone. Mm -hmm. That's the brown one that is in the JSP volumes. It's the brown or the white one. There's arguments for both of those. Mm. Okay. I mean, I have my opinion, but I I don't think the evidence is good enough. Okay, so wait, let's pause for a second. So Joseph Smith had total how many seer stones, Mike? Uh, He had a white one. He had a brown one. Are there any others? (laughs) He definitely had a white one, a brown one, and then... Like in the back of Joseph Smith's seer stones, there's some that were like speculated. So I've put them in there. Okay. Uh, some say like the green stone. The green stone. I don't know that there's really evidence for that, but. <laughs> okay. So for sure a white one and for sure a brown one. Yeah. I think that's, I think the green one's created from people in the 20th century trying to sell it, you know. 
But, okay. <laughs> so Oliver Cowdery got a seer stone from Joseph Smith. And this is supposed to be part of where Oliver Cowdery was going to translate like Joseph. And he participates in a lot of the translation process, or at least some of them. And so he gets the seer stone and he possesses it. So is this like circa DNC 6, 7, and 8, and 9, like that era? Well, he, he gets it once the church is organized. Oh, okay. So okay. He gets, he's actually given one of Joseph Smith's seer stones. And we get this in a letter in which Brigham Young finds out about the seer stone, or he knows about the seer stone. And so we have a letter that, that says, yes, that seer stone is extant. And Oliver Cowdery dies. And so Phineas Young goes and gets the seer stone from Oliver Cowdery's uh, wife. This is Elizabeth Whitmer, right? Elizabeth, yes. Yeah. And so Elizabeth has the seer stone. And then we have documented letters on the ground that Phineas Young went and got it. Mm. And the Whitmers are angry because Brigham Young has it, but Brigham Young wanted it because it was Joseph Smith's seer stone. Mm. And so like all of that actually has a lot of historical evidence to demonstrate that there is a single seer stone. Joseph possessed it. He gave it to Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery died. He gave it to Phineas Young. Phineas Young gives it to Brigham Young. And Brigham Young makes a speech that he got it in Utah. So we have a Journal of Discourse speech where Brigham Young says, I have Joseph Smith's seer stone. So that's pretty solid provenance. Yeah. It's a pretty brief provenance, yeah. And uh, this provenance is all about that brown seer stone that shows up in the JSP volumes. Yeah. Mike, as someone that worked on the JSP volumes, um, was there controversy as to putting a photograph of that brown seer stone into those books? Yeah. Because the JSP is seen as uh, authoritative by, by most church members. Yeah, we like we wanted for D1, which had the translation in it for Documents Volume 1, we put up a request and did a, a lot of work on provenance to say, you know, this is part of the Joseph Smith volume, like it's the production of text. Hmm. And as part of that volume, we asked for it and they didn't feel like it was the right timing. But they at that point, you know, there was enough evidence that we had produced anyways that they had it that, you know, it was taken seriously. And then once they decided to do the printer's manuscript, they asked again. And the decision was to actually take a picture of it. And so still, I never saw it. But like, I think it's a sacred item. I think it's a kind of relic that should be treated with sacredness. Like for me, you know, the, the handkerchief, Joseph's handkerchief in the museum. Yeah, the, the big red one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I, it's a hard pass. I don't think like someone who values the sacrality of something like that. Um, I'd prefer not to put it out on display. Now, that's with some thought. I think originally I thought, oh, we need to show the seer stone. But, you know, like 10, 12 years on, my religious side wants to think, well, let's treat this more like a sacred relic instead of like a, a museum piece. Like, I want it to be religious. This isn't just some historical adventure or adventure in provenance. Mm -hmm. And just for any listeners who are wondering what the world the handkerchief is all about, that was not involved in the translation process. <laughs> there were stones, there was a hat, yes, but the handkerchief, that's a Nauvoo story. Yeah, that's, there's someone, uh, he's got sick twins across the river, comes to Joseph. Joseph Smith can't go and, and give a blessing to these sick infant twins, so he gives his handkerchief to Wilford Woodruff. That's it. Wilford Woodruff takes it, and actually Wilford Woodruff, I think, treats it as a relic, it's fair to say. Yeah. There's several times in his journal when he mentions giving a blessing and then putting the handkerchief on them because he believed it had sacred powers. And those kids were healed when he wiped their faces with the handkerchief, right? Mm -hmm. And I think he said he kept it as something of, of a league between him and Joseph, right? It was a tie, a, a physical symbol of their bond, which is cool. So, And so, like, at some level, this handkerchief that's being passed off and healing people through the power of God is literally one of those religious moments that should be wondered about, should be thought about should be valued. Mm -hmm. And by turning it just into a handkerchief, I think that's part of the secularization process. I mean, maybe that's a little bit too philosophical, but I think that makes sense to people. Like, so in the last podcast, I heard you guys talking about, 
you explain that it's done in 60 days, or I think, it not it 56, his latest one? About 60, I think he says, yeah, about 60. About 60 days, and that's pretty cool. That's a very interesting fact. And it's actually a piece of secular evidence that would demonstrate that he couldn't have done that. Right, I think that's the point, yeah. So it's, it's an evidentiary piece of work that demonstrates a miracle. Doesn't that seem strange to you, that I'm producing evidence that it was a miracle? Well, doesn't it push against, I mean, we have to use the categories that are at our disposal, right? We have to say, like, well, what do you mean it's a miracle? I'm saying, well, we can't explain it. What do you mean we can't explain it? Well, it was done in 60 days. He's only 23, and it's got all these complex Hebraisms and stuff. Like, how do you explain that except to say it's a miracle? I mean... I think it's nice to have the secular ideas to push against in order to define what is miraculous and what is not, right? If it, if it cannot be explained by secular means, then I think we can say that's kind of uh, smacking up against the miraculous, don't you think? I like this discussion. I think it's the right discussion to have. But so if secularism isn't like in opposition to religion. Okay. It's actually in juxtaposition to religions. Now, that being said, like, they also produce their own kinds of norms and morals and ethics. And those normative realities that secularism produces creates tools to analyze things in the secular world. Yeah. I would demand that if we're really looking at religion, I would think that we would need outside of comparisons, like what you said. I thought that was a very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Outside of comparisons to say you're different. I would suppose the tools that we possess should be different. Mm -hmm. Because it's undemonstrable, it defies demonstration, particularly in the case of the Book of Mormon. Like, And we went the rounds two weeks ago in our our episode two weeks ago just saying, listen, it's inexplicable, undemonstrable, like how else this could have been done but through miraculous means. But there I am again using secularism and pushing against that to say and to suggest the miraculous. Come on, be honest with me. Do you believe the Book of Mormon is true because of chiasmus? Hmm. I think it's compelling. I think my mind is compelled by the complexity of that and the beauty of that. Um, I think it's something that needs to be dealt with. Like if someone wants to not believe in the Book of Mormon, like you probably can't slough that off. Um, If someone wants to believe in the Book of Mormon, I'd say that's probably not sufficient to go on, but it's pretty awesome. It's like it's a factor in the complex universe of testimony. I'd say stuff like chiasmus is the icing on the cake, right? Mm. But it's not the primary uh, substance of where our belief comes from. It comes from, like you said, a spiritual witness because those secular arguments towards the Book of Mormon are helpful. They are. They genuinely helped me when I was exploring the Book of Mormon and gaining my testimony. But they're frosting. You know, they're they're not going to be sustaining enough to keep a person there. It's something that you'd look at and file under your, your that's interesting file but probably wouldn't affect or change your life. It's something deeper and like the words you've been using, inexplicable, if we're trying to explain why we believe. Chiasmus is almost dumbfounding. It's like, how on earth did that get in the Book of Mormon, right? Joseph's 23 in 1829 in America, where we don't even know chiasmus, right? That's not something that people are aware of here yet. It's dumbfounding yet. I think it does stand in the logic and reason part of my brain as like a lion in the path of trying to explain away the Book of Mormon through some secular logic. Yeah. There's another question here that I've heard you talk about before, Mike, and I'd love to have our listeners hear from you. The question that one of our listeners submitted was, do you see any way to reconcile the two main theories about how Joseph Smith produced the English Book of Mormon? Tight translation, where Joseph is seeing and reading directly from the stones with little to no volition, versus loose translation, where Joseph sees or receives the general ideas non-verbally or pre-verbally and has high volition to compose the text in using his own words. So I've heard you talk before about that dichotomy of Loose translation versus tight translation. This person asks, after having examined the evidence, how do you come down on this? And do you take a side or do you have a reconciliatory third option? (laughs) First of all, like Royal Skousen has done so much for 
Book of Mormon studies and like using tight and loose has become like a real language that we use to talk about it. So I appreciate this. I think it's it's part of like this Latter-day Saint culture of trying to identify the value of scriptural text at this point, you know. And now here's my position on this. I think the problem that comes in with Skousen's model is choosing one. Okay. Like I've had this discussion with quite a few other colleagues here, like when they read the text, there's parts of it they, they want to argue that read as if it's a direct, absolute translation. It appears ancient. And then there's other places that don't appear ancient. The text isn't even across the whole of the text. Hmm. And so making a blanket statement, like I think it's all tight translation, is more like a statement saying, I know God is the translator, therefore I trust every word in here is what God wanted it to be. That's not really tight translation. In fact, God could have, in a concept of translation, it could have been a religious translation where he was translating what was written on the gold plates to relate to a 19th century readership in exact terms of that translation for them to get a religious meaning out of it that was originally embedded on the plates and then in the text of the Book of Mormon. Which doesn't one way or another disprove either side, does it? Because it could be tight translation and still be malleable, or it could be loose and be malleable, correct? Yeah, that's getting at why choosing one of those categories, they're just thinking categories. They're not a position one takes. Mm. And that's why, you know, thinking through them is fun. Like you think about the tight translation, what one might mean and what one might not mean. I think that Skousen has given us a great model there, yeah. but he also doesn't say, and don't complicate these. Mm. That's not what Skousen is saying. And so my take on it is simple. Like, I think there is a, a kind of tight translation as a devotional practice, mm. but I'm also very curious about why God translated parts of it the way that he did mm -hmm. and wonder if it represents the original exactly. I don't think it ever exactly, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of our colleagues, Stefan Tager, he likes instead to use the term tight dictation, saying that God's translating loosely, but Joseph is getting a tight dictation from God calculated to a 19th century audience. Yeah. Another kind of variation of this theme. Yeah. Interesting. Well, for any listeners that want to dig deeper into this, we'll put in the show notes, Grant Hardy just published a great article summarizing all of this with the complexity of it on both sides, great scholars on both sides. And now you've heard another great scholar with his thoughts on this. That's super cool. Thank you, Mike, for that. Let me go to another question that uh, you kind of touched on. I want to dig deeper on. Another uh, listener asked this, is there any good evidence to help us understand Joseph's reasons for considerable revisions made in the second edition, was that 1837? And to some extent, the third edition, was that 1840 maybe, of the Book of Mormon? Like, do we know why Joseph revised? Did he ever give reasons or do you have any hypotheses for the purposes behind his revisions? I imagine, and even with the translation of the Bible, th this is like an old theory that Robert Matthews favored this in his book, but this idea that he saw this vision and, and it was actually his opinion, he felt as if he knew what happened. He knew the broader understanding of what was going on. And so that's what he did with the Bible translation, where he's, he's adjusting it according to what was more accurate, according to what he saw. And if all-seeing visions are like the vision of Nephi, where he actually sees Jesus in the stable, it's like a vision of the stable, and he sees Jesus on the cross in this all-seeing vision. Mm -hmm. I think it's fun to think through this as the concept. Like in 1837, is, is Joseph to the point where he feels as if he gets what happened and he's adjusting the text according to what he believes God has revealed to him? Mm -hmm. I imagine whether it's his all-seeing vision, he definitely feels confident enough to make changes in 1837. Yeah, that doesn't seem like he feels like that's out of bounds at all in terms of his prerogative as a prophet. Like, he can do that. Yeah. I feel like in 1837, correct me if I'm wrong, he's just taking out a ton of, and it came to passes, uh, clarifying instead of like Mary being the mother of God, Mary is the mother of the Son of God. Maybe that's where pure and delightsome is changed in 1837. Yeah. It doesn't seem like there's major, major changes happening. It seems almost to like update the text to make it more readable. Some of the grammar is being tweaked, maybe with some of the Pratt brothers giving him feedback. 
all that kind of stuff. Is that fair or is there more to the changes that you see might be connected to some of this panoptic visions that Joseph has had? I mean, it's, the reason I go there is the question is, is does Joseph feel like he can just make it more grammatically correct, right? Is his engagement with the text more than just an editorial process where he's like, oh, I actually think it reads better this way, Yeah. which certainly maybe that's some of it. And I think there's some evidence for that. So my attempt here is to say something like, I think Joseph feels more than just I'm an editor. He feels as if he is representing what God might represent from his prophetic position. Mm -hmm. And so I think with changes within these scriptures, I don't want it just to be editorial, even though it can be that because they feel as if editorial God wants them to change it. But I don't think Joseph has lost the sense, nor do Latter-day Saints even up till now, that when there's these adjustments that they don't feel empowered by God to do them. Yeah. Cool. Well, this is fun. I'm going to go to another question here. Someone asked, There are sometimes some who claim that Joseph was assisted by the co-translators in writing what, what amounts to scriptural fan fiction. What's your read of the historical evidence in favor or against this? Two episodes ago, we went through Brian Hell's article going through the various naturalistic theories on Book of Mormon production. If it wasn't miraculous, then how, how do we explain it through some secular means? I think this is a variation on that. Uh, what do you want to say about this, Mike? Uh, your read of the historical evidence, any co-translators, co-conspirators, co-writers with Joseph? Um, so someone helping him do it, right? Mm -hmm. So whether Solomon Spaulding or Oliver Cowdery or Sidney Rigdon, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any good evidence. That, that's the short answer. <laughs> the issue with that is that Oliver Cowdery and Sidney Rigdon in particular, who are the closest to him, like if those two helped him write it or, or were co-authors or collaborators or, or the author of the Book of Mormon and they had more time to do it, okay. they both were disassociated from Joseph Smith in ways that they actively tried to disregard some of the things that he did, yeah. even that he was a prophet. Like both of them at points were questioning that. Yeah, that he was maybe a fallen prophet, right? Yeah, a fallen prophet. So in those moments... You would imagine that if they wrote the Book of Mormon, they might have said that. Yeah, <laughs> those would have been opportune moments for them to kick or to push back against Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's another one. Why do you think Joseph himself, the one who knew the most about the translation process, why didn't he offer many details about it? You know, there was this one like perfect moment. They were in like this church council. Yeah. Hiram's there. Hiram says, Joseph, why don't you tell us how the Book of Mormon was translated? And with a perfect setup, bump, set, all Joseph had to do was spike it. He said, ah, it's not expedient for me to relate these things. It's not expedient that this generation should know at this time, something like that. Yeah. Do you have a theory on why Joseph wouldn't share or why the Lord didn't want him to share the details? I mean, here we are speculating. This could have been a much shorter series if we just had Joseph himself just telling us exactly how it worked. Yeah. Um, why do you think there's some caution around that? I think with a, like some document analysis of that 1832 Hiram conference that you're talking about, yeah. you can tell that they've shifted the topic. They weren't talking about that. This was a side conversation, and Joseph Smith wants to move back to what they were doing. So we have pretty tight minutes of that meeting, mm -hmm. and they capture that, and Joseph Smith moves back. I don't think Joseph Smith is saying, I'm never going to tell you guys how I translated the Book of Mormon. Mm. Like it appears that from Emma and Martin Harris, they saw it. And there's also other records of people who didn't see it that are getting the story from Joseph Smith. So I'm not sure that's a good enough piece of evidence to say that Joseph Smith never, ever said anything. Gotcha. It was his way of saying, let's get back on topic. That's a distracting question, Hiram. Let's go back to what we were talking about. Yeah, he's avoiding the topic because they're in the middle of a conference and someone changed the topic. Oh, uh, interesting. I mean, you can go read those minutes on Joseph Smith's website, but that's the way I think is the right way to read that passage. Hmm. I mean, we could debate about that, but I, I think that's the right way to read it. Gotcha. Go back to that question again, Scott. What was the question? I, I think I wanted to say something else. Okay. 
why did Joseph feel guarded about sharing the details? Was there some reason you think that he was guarded about that? Yeah. I think the other part of this, and I think, like, imagine, like, what Joseph Smith experiencing the translation. It's this miraculous occurrence where words appear on the seer stone. Mm -hmm. So that's like a brief demonstration of what's going on. And, and the real phenomenological question to ask there is, is that occurring in his head? Is it occurring on the stones? Like Mark Asher's McGee in his master's dissertation dealt with this 25 years ago. Mm. But the experience, what this demonstrates is the experience that Joseph Smith had. He must have, and I think there's evidence that he struggled how to tell people about it. Yeah. No matter what, when you're saying, I saw words on a seer stone and I read them out. And at what level and how much is Joseph unsure what's happening? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of psychological questions there. And it goes back to the question, how do you describe a miracle like that? Yeah. Are you likely to give great details when you don't feel you can express some of them? I think all of those questions have to be asked when you wonder why Joseph Smith, there aren't a ton of records of Joseph Smith writing down what happened. His favorite way to say it was gift and power of God. That's how it happened, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's an interesting thought that maybe he himself couldn't fully explain it. Maybe if you said, yeah, but like, how did it work? He might say, I don't know exactly. Which then turns Oliver Cowdery's, Martin Harris's, and Emma's witnesses into the very first theory of translation. Meaning what? Meaning that they sat there and watched him do it mm -hmm. and then made sense of what they saw. Mm. Everyone else past that has their concept and theory of translation. But we value those three individuals, witnesses, because they're the ones that saw it and are making sense of it. Mm. And they're likely asking Joseph what's going on. We don't have any direct record of that conversation. but mm. Interesting. You make us think. I love it. <laughs> well done. Well done. Thanks. Mike, for our last question, we just want to ask, you're bright, you're good, you're honest. Uh, what makes you a believer in the prophetic mission of Joseph Smith and the core claims of the Restoration? Yeah, that's a good question. As a teacher at BYU, I get a chance to sort of think through this a lot. Students are always wondering, what is it that makes you believe? And uh, I, I think the character of Joseph Smith himself is, is one of the key factors for me. Mm. Uh, I think his ability to go through so much and, and have a maintenance of the things that he saw, like at some given point, you know, giving up on them would be a, an option. <laughs> It'd be a lot easier. And I think his character alone puts me in a, a place where I can have a genuine interest a space where I can consider the things that he's claiming. And so it's important for me to get into the belief in the restoration through the person who's restoring these things. Mm. And so I'm earnestly investigating the restoration because I have a kind of trust in him automatically. Mm. Now, that being said, the things that are being delivered, like the world that he creates, it's not just a church, it's not just an institution. It's a world that he creates and that, that survives even today. A space where, like, my experience of the restoration often comes when I, like, get my 16-year-old and we visit an old lady and we bring her food and uh, we shovel other people's walks in the, in the winter. We build a family. We come together with a community of people who are usually pretty different than us. And it's created this unbelievable world for me that fosters a need to help the poor a moral system that enables me to be honest, even when it's easy not to be. Uh, it creates relationships that have been unbelievably life-changing. And it's endowed me with a belief that I can come together with everybody, like I can be a part of God's plan that he's created. Mm. And so maybe Joseph Smith just restored a bunch of ideas and some scripture. Those are remarkable in themselves. But for me, these ideas come together in a very real world, a world that has shaped my life and made me into a good person, well, as good as a person that God could possibly make out of me. And that shape that my life has come under and become is because of the restoration. And so the experience of God has come through the restoration for me. And when I live that restoration authentically, 
I am my very best self, and I find God the most often in that. Mm. And so this isn't like a deductive model. And so Joseph Smith is a prophet. Uh, This model is me saying, I live in the world that Joseph Smith restored, and that world has enabled me to be good and to find God. That's why I believe. Thank you for listening to this episode of Church History Matters. For more of Dr. Michael McKay's scholarship on the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, we highly recommend beginning with his book co-authored with Garrett Dirkma, entitled From Darkness Unto Light, Joseph Smith's Translation and Publication of the Book of Mormon. Today's episode was produced and edited by Scott Woodward, with show notes and transcript by Gabe Davis. Church History Matters is a podcast of Scripture Central, a nonprofit which exists to help build enduring faith in Jesus Christ by making Latter-day Saint scripture and church history accessible, comprehensible, and defensible to people everywhere. For more resources to enhance your gospel study, go to scripturecentral.org, where everything is available for free because of the generous donations of people like you. Thank you so much for being a part of this with us.